welcome everyone. Welcome and this is welcome to the seventh session in our Trellis Seminar Series 2021 and it's only Wednesday morning too. So um, for those of you who don't know us, Trellis is the charity that supports therapeutic gardening in Scotland with over 480 groups in our network. We provide training and good practice sharing and we aim to promote the highest quality of therapeutic gardening services and enable everyone to get the best out of them. You can find links to all our resources online uh, at the Trellis homepage. So today the session is approximately 60 minutes long. We have a presentation of about 45 minutes and then a Q&A session. So I'm going to encourage you to use the chat feature in Zoom to ask questions. And one of our team, which is Joe today, is going to voice the questions uh, to our presenter at the end of the presentation. So to come to our presentation today, it's an absolute delight and a privilege for me to welcome John Marshall, who is a total enthusiast and an expert on all things potatoes. So be prepared to be enlightened. Um, John is going to take us a journey, on a journey through time and around the globe to Saudi Arabia, Vietnam, Xanadu and Peru. So it's going to be fantastic. John has spent a lifetime in the potato industry, starting on the family farm in Scotland. Then he was a student um, potato inspector he was then a supervisor with the Potato Marketing Board. It's got a bit of a theme in this, isn't it? He was a seed trader with <laughs> Dalgetty and Greenvale, and then a buyer for WCF Horticulture, supplying garden centres throughout the UK. In his retirement, he now does talks and presentations like this, and runs workshops, and he does teaching in the classroom with the Royal Highland Educational Trust. So I'm now going to pass you over to John, who is going to share his presentation with us. Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody. Great to be here. Um, and I am great to be here. I'm an Elkhter Mukti. <laughs> and the sun is shining, not into my eyes, thankfully. <laughs> but, Right, I will just fire on. I've had a, a wonderful introduction and this is all about potatoes. And it's, yes, potatoes are journey through time and around the globe. What is a potato, you may well ask? An underground stem has been selected by man to produce huge tubers. And one potato will produce 20, 30. So it makes it a good idea as a food. Plant one, you get plenty. Most of us probably know the potato like this, all the favorite dishes. And there are many and varied and getting more. And in that powerhouse, 175 grams, it's just loaded with minerals and vitamins, of course, carbohydrates, but more so than the, the bananas and spinach helpings and, that you see behind, and no cholesterol. So a good, healthy product. But can you imagine 500 years ago, if there were no potatoes, if there were no potatoes today, where would the fish be without the chips? Where would your mince and tatties be without the tatties? Well, 500 years ago, there were no potatoes. Well, not quite, because high up there in the Andes, potatoes were being cultivated and domesticated. And this was over 9,000 years ago, Andean farmers, long before the Incas. And there's new research that's discovered hunter-gatherers were using a similar Solanaceae in Chile 14,500 years ago. So it's been on the go a long time, but we have only had it for 500 years. It was only when the conquistadors went looking for just post Columbia, just looking for the gold and silver. And they would bring the gold and silver back to Europe, 
across the sea. Sea travel was opening up and it was to go around the world soon. But they were bringing it back, probably in ship stores. And there wasn't a great fanfare. Nobody knew about the potato. And Hawkins, Raleigh, Drake, all names associated. And when did it actually arrive? 1568? No, who knows? But definitely Raleigh, fake news. It's more likely the scientists have deduced that the potatoes came in through Tenerife, through um, ships reloading, coming back from the New World. And they would grow. They would acclimatise because they've been grown near the equator at high altitudes. They would be acclimatising to our long day length in Europe. There were a few that cottoned on quickly to the potato. And Frederick I, um, he was fighting a war with Louis the 16th, the 15th of France. He captured these pharmacists, Parmentia. We all know about Parmentia potatoes. But he recognised, he was being fed as a prisoner of war potatoes. He recognised how good they were. Others were not so keen on it, you know. It wasn't mentioned in the Bible and it came up with all sorts of weird shapes and sizes. It was rumours that it caused leprosy. So there was a bit of resistance and we all remember, when, well, we don't remember, but your mother all have told you when you were young, you turned up your nose at food and this is what adults were like. But in those days, needs must. And um, the population in Europe was growing, particularly in Ireland, the west of Scotland, with, with the clearances after Culloden and the Napoleonic Wars, people were kelping on the island. That's burning seaweed to make potassium. And the Outer Hebrides here, you could see great mounds of seaweed. Apart from the kelping and potassium, it provided a great fertilizer. And you could see the women folk taking creels up there to the moors. If you've ever been to the west coast of Scotland, um, particularly in the autumn, where the dead bracken is, you can see where they used to grow them. And there are, there are many little patches dotted about. This is on the Isle of Mull. But these were cylindrical. Up. If you can imagine, rainfall was, you know, three times the amount that we have on the east coast here, 30 inches, 150 inches. So they needed a technique to keep the potatoes out of the water. You could see these two, father and son, Connemara, who just came across them, dibbling in potatoes into the lazy bed, the raised bed with the, the ditch down in the side. That was how they produced them. Now, they started needs must, as I say, and they were selling all their grain to pay for the rent, and potatoes were the main diet, the only diet, and seven pounds a head, or 3.5 kilos thereabouts. But this dependency on one food was a bit worrying. And this is what happened by the time, and we've kind of leapfrogged to 1845, 1846. There was a disease that was causing all the potatoes to rot. And then disease to humans cut in, scurvy, diarrhea, cholera, typhus. This became known as the, the Irish potato famine. And you can see these gaunt figures in Dublin. And they're starving. Over a million died and a million and a half more emigrated to America. West of Scotland wasn't so bad. They were short of potatoes. Um, they managed to emigrate or move to central Scotland, but the famine wasn't uh, as bad. The leaves were dying, like these spots. Nobody knew what it was. Some thought it was rain and it spread down to the tuber, so there was absolutely nothing there. We know today it's known as potato blight. At that time, they were growing this wonderful variety of lumpers, and you'd think, why would they grow such a, an awkward shaped potato, difficult to peel? They didn't peel them, but um, this potato was the best yielding one, so everybody was growing on it. Uh, if it had been a mixed variety, it might have fault of the spread of the blight. Now, a bit of lesson here. Potato is a clone. You plant one potato and you maybe get 10, 20, 30, and they're all genetically identical, identical. So if you plant one diseased lumper or one diseased potato, you're going to get a whole basket full of disease. So what they desperately needed back there after the famine was to get new varieties. And this became known as plant breeding. And I'll just 
take you through this step by step and then continue the story afterwards. You get two good varieties and you, you try to, to cross them, but you can't just put them in a dark room and hope for the best. It doesn't work that way in nature. You need a bumblebee and the bumblebee's got the necessary buzz factor and it will flip from flower to flower um, cross-pollinating. You can see it dodging around here. But this is what happens in nature. I don't think the bumblebees are, are very expert here, but in the wild, yes. Um, today, plant breeders need to have more focus. They need to plan so they know the parents and the parentage and there's no cross chance of a haphazard bee buzzing about. So here you can see a plant breeder and she's taking the, the pollen from the anthers and going to put them onto the stamen of another flower. Job done, quite happy. And they're then covered with a polythene bag and what comes is something that looks like a potato, a fertilized a tomato rather. Uh, the fertilized flower produces these plums and each plum contains seeds, probably up to 100 seeds. And each one is genetically different. Some of them are worse and some of them better. The job of the plant breeder is to find out which is the good one. And he may, he may have many hundreds of thousands of plantlets like that. And over a few years, he's got to grow them up um, from the tiny seed. And each one of those will produce potatoes. I have a friend in Dundee, and he has a a breeding program. He's only got 3,000 new varieties here, but he's got to get them down to six in a couple of years. It's quite a, an exercise. But the first year produces tiny, tiny little tubers, which are then planted out. Well, back to this post-Irish potato famine. We're in the city of Discovery, and there was a farmer there called Farmer Son William Patterson, and he was very excited. He wanted to do something about the famine. And he created um, a breeding programme and he produced new varieties. One such variety was Victoria, a white seedling. And he got special permission from the Queen, Queen Victoria to call it that. We don't see it today, but this is what it looked like. We get it in the museum plots, but um, it's not in the supermarkets today. This man, Archibald Finlay, a publican from Mark Inch, he took this on board and he started using that Victoria to breed his varieties. And Majestic was the most famous. He wrote a book, so you can see black and white pictures of what it was like around 1900. You can see this is Ochter Mukti with the horses and the women folk outside at the Tatty Pit. It was too cold for all these seedlings and it was a lot of hard work. So he hired, he bought an old linen mill, a redundant one, and put his promising new seedlings into these so he could sift through them and sort them out in, in climate weather. He was very successful. He bred lots of varieties, wonderful names, heroines out of some of the books, out of Walter Scott or David, Robbie Louis, David Robbie Louis Stevenson, Ginny Deans, Katie Glover. His most famous, perhaps, was Majestic, and it had a market share of 60 years, and uh, not 60%. Um, another one, El Dorado in 1904, made 31, 30 pounds for a four ounce tuber. This was a huge amount of money. There was the so-called potato boom, and his varieties were in big demand. Uh, a strange name for a potato, Kitchener cartoon, but um, he at the time was the hero of the day. My father, he came into potatoes. He was born in 1910, but he came into the agricultural industry after university, um, just between the wars. And the wars were a, a rude awakening. We were suddenly going to have no food. And the World War II, uh, the controllers reasoned that the potatoes were to the best solution for survival. And you see a potato peak promoting the potatoes. I won't sing this song, but it's very uh, telling. Potatoes whole, potatoes pied, enjoy them all, including chips. Remembering spuds don't come in ships. Now, 
we were dependent. 70% of our food in Britain was coming from America, New Zealand. It was coming in convoys. Um, and they were being torpedoed by the U-boats. So the potato was the solution. It became the, the most important crop in the dig for victory. My father's plan, because the seed potatoes, which are healthy in Scotland, long been recognised, um, were going down to Lincolnshire and Yorkshire, the, the main larders of England. And here you can see my father growing potatoes high up near Pitlochry in the hills. They're far away from other potatoes and they're high enough up and there's no aphids, no green fly. Green fly spread the virus diseases and flips from potato to potato. It was particularly bad uh, in Lincolnshire in the fens. Um, and the diseases would uh, destroy the plants. My father would bring these high-grade seed potatoes down to his lowland farm um, in Perthshire, near Dunning, and grow them on and then sell them to the Lincolnshire farmers. But this is what they were frightened of. The virus could cause stunting, severe stunting, and decimate yields. And it would spread very quickly. This is another one called leaf roll. And again, no yield. So it was very important to breed them. Now, 1950, I arrived on the scene, a farm boy. And just to give you an idea of what it was like then, um, a joy and horses were just disappearing. And we had real snow in those days. And you can see that it took 50 men to dig out these massive snow drifts in front of the, the farmhouse. The big cold farmhouse, no central heating. We had to go outside to keep warm and snowball fights warmed us all up. And we'd all go down to the, the hoffs, the lowland fields, uh, which are frozen and we'd be skating, everybody would be out. And uh, it was a great joy. But this is where my potato education must have started. And my uncle Arthur, a, a salesman, would chant, where do you come from? I would reply, Donegal, out of the tatties, off his small. How do you eat them? Skin and all. Ever sick? Not at all. And the next lesson on the farm was how to work and how to work without complaining. Potato harvesting, renowned for sore backs and cold long days. And that was a joy. And many people remember this with great nostalgia and all the, the local gossip was exchanged. There's a, a whole talk on this one on its own. But my father, he grew these potatoes, and the healthy ones, free from virus, and smaller plots, and starting off with one. But he needed to test them to prove to the government that they were free from virus. So he built this greenhouse, not for tomatoes, a laboratory at the end, and uh, got some child labour to help pot up these plants. And really, it's not believable, but this greenhouse was filled with tobacco plants. Tobacco plants were markers for viruses because some of the viruses in the potatoes are very difficult to detect at low level, low intensity. So we would inoculate the tobacco plants, the young ones, with the potato juice. And in a few weeks time, they would grow and manifest a, a mottle. And there you can see my sister, she's inspecting them to see if there's any mottles. They were all virus free. And of course, we had to harvest these small plots of potato. Um, all hard work. And, you know, I was growing up in this atmosphere and, and scientists from various research stations would come and examine the potatoes. And I'm a school weaver here. You can see the rebel coming out, shirt tail hanging out, the hair getting a bit longer. This would be 1960. Six, And then as a student, briefly, and this was perhaps which drew me back into the potato industry, I became a potato inspector. Quite respectable in those days. Even Gordon Brown had hair to match mine. And a car, wheels were essential. So we, we travelled around working for the government, inspecting crops in pairs, going up and down to examine the fields to see if they were visually free from viruses. Then it was job, must, needs must. And I got a job with the Potato Marketing Board. 
the potato marketing board was a relic of the Ministry of Food. The government wanted to control potatoes because there were 80,000 growers up and down the country. So they needed 36 offices to sort of regulate the potatoes. It was a, an interesting job. There was quotas um, and we had to ensure the farmer was keeping to his quota by measuring fields. Sometimes the hard way, but other ways, aerial photography was introduced. You can just see red markings where the potato fields are outlined. We then would dig in the fields and assess the crops. Um, this was a joy to do this, particularly if the weather was good and the, the scenery. We would again work in pairs at this point. And, uh, riddling them. If there were too many potatoes, the government had guaranteed the farmer, the government had set a target acreage so that that would feed uh, enough people. But how can you predict yields and weather? So quite often there were too many potatoes and if there were too many potatoes the price would go to zero because of the fresh product and you couldn't keep it and everyone wanted to sell theirs first. So the government with the use of the potato marketing board remove potatoes from the market. These ones have been taken out of human consumption circulation and they're being denatured, just covered with dye because they're going to be fed to cattle. And the, this would be, the farmer would get a set price and the, the stock feeder, the cattle feeder, would be able to buy them more cheaply. There was a deficit, but this was stabilizing potato production. They would go down the west because that's where the dairy herds were, where the grass was growing and no potatoes, down to Ayrshire, down to the dairy herds. And of course, cattle and, and even deer would, would tuck in and everybody seemed to benefit. But then there were 60,000 growers. In today's world, you can see how uh, picturesque Scotland is, the purple, almost the, the purple heather, we'd say, that, that's the mountainous region and round the coast, is a narrow strip of land. Um, this area, which was good for growing potatoes uh, during the kelping years um, back in 1790, but in today's world, uh, they need good productive soil. And you could see the potato areas being concentrated in Perth and Angus and Fife and a few up Aberdeenshire and Mauritius. But great soil and stretching over to the Grampian Mountains. Potato production today is down to 2,000 growers. So from 80,000 growers, uh, it's become specialized. There's been integration, there's been uh, amalgamation of skills, there's been skills coming in. And it all kicks off with the farmer plowing his field, probably for another potato grower. Um, and then machines, I mean, incredible inventions. These machines are, bedding stones. And uh, these machines, of course, are planting potatoes. You can't exactly see what's being done, but the potatoes in the, the hopper of the, the red uh, planter are, are falling down below the ground along with fertilizer. And it's a very streamlined, slick operation compared to what it used to be. Unfortunately, we still haven't had a solution for this terrible potato blight, it mutates as, as fast as the new varieties are coming out. So unfortunately, as I say, there's a cocktail of sprays and they have to be eight or nine tons. And the, there is a train of thought and very much more now as research is being done into genomes that uh, gene editing could perhaps provide the solution, um, which would be they, they wouldn't do it, of course, unless it was safe. At the, at the moment, the Scottish government's being a bit hesitant, but uh, the rest of the world seems to be moving forward on this line. And there we are, ready for growth. The potato green leaves have all been um, either pulverised down or some, uh, some chemical put on them. Again, they're looking at different techniques, perhaps hauling the stems out. Again, there's a great emphasis on using less chemical. But the crop yields are huge. They've moved from seven tonnes an acre to 30 tonnes an acre. New varieties, new techniques. They're ready for harvest. And harvest, uh, this is perhaps the most visual operation. 
they've created really these giant sieves, leaving the soil behind and unearthing the potatoes. And in Scotland, we put them into to boxes, which you can see there. Um, even in today's world and changing climate, the machines have to become more robust as caterpillars. This is a huge self-propelled machine and uh, uh, rather than being pulled. But they're the order of the day with uh, the larger growers. In France, uh, amazing, up in the Calais uh, ground, you know, the huge flat fields. And this harvester will, will lift four rows at once. But back in Scotland, we're going off. And you, you probably notice this. The potato growers, not very many of them, 2,000, have centralised stores. And they're renting potato ground from farms all over uh, you know, within a 30 mile radiance. So you may have to trail behind these vehicles for quite some time, but just be patient because <laughs> the, the grower has only got a narrow window and the rains could all come all too often. They're going to centralised stores. This one's at Burlton and they're being stacked high in these one ton boxes right to the roof. The stores are going to be chilled down and kept at temperature of three or four degrees. Um, and this will prevent them from sprouting and uh, keep them over the winter so they're fresh to go into the supermarkets. It's really quite a change, and you've seen this before, from what it was like in the 1950s, um, the steam train depicting it. But sorbacks, yes, and lifting into these wire baskets. And potatoes then were not stored in sheds, they were stored in what would best describe as a giant Toblerone. A triangular Toblerone, yes. And the wheat straw would protect them from the rain, it would just run off, and lots of earth on top to protect them from frost. And of course, there were lots of people involved, there's not so many machines. And you can see these hardy workers, they're having a break behind the, the pit and having a cup of tea, their peacetime, as it was known. Now, you may wonder what these playmobiles are doing there. There's seven of them. And this is one of the tools that I use in my talks in the, the classrooms through the Royal Highland Educational Trust. Each one depicts a billion people. So seven billion people are thereabouts in the world today. That is a lot of mouths to feed. And in 30 years time, um, you know, there'll be two billion more are the estimates. So a lot more mouths to feed and there's less and less land. You know, it's not so easy to grow wheat, it's not so easy to grow rice particularly because you need lots of water, but potatoes are very versatile. You, you can grow potatoes just about anywhere in the world except for the North and South Pole, uh, as we'll see. And I traveled around the world partly trying to uh, promote Scottish seed and sell. My, my first experience was Fraserburgh, um, just after the Russia had opened up Perestroika, we had got a deal to supply them with potatoes. And you could see lorries lined up along the docks and they are loading into a ship sacks of potatoes, 50 kilogram sacks of seed potatoes. And the stevia doors have to work hard because they can't load in the rain. And uh, if the, the rain comes, they have to shut the covers and uh, it can become very expensive if a ship doesn't get away on time. There's something called demurrage, which is a huge fee. Now, after that visual experience of watching, my boss suddenly said, well, I think you should go out to Saudi Arabia. And I was thinking, you know, I've done geography, that's a desert, there's no rain. Why would people want to grow potatoes in Saudi Arabia? But Yes, they were growing wheat already, and you can see these vast circles below, um, you know, a, a hundred hectares of, of wheat in each circle, huge areas. So I went to the Riyadh Agriculture Store, I met, um, I think he was a prince, and some important people who had farms, and they suggested that they wanted Scottish seed potatoes to grow crisps, or chips as they call them. Um, Mafi Mushkala, no problem. And 
interesting enough, the variety was Atlantic, um, grown in the desert. I like the irony of that. But there I was in the middle of the desert, sand dunes behind and camels behind that, and uh, two men doing what they all do all over the world, looking at the potato crop. But here, the, sun, the, the heat was intense, up to 50 degrees, and no rain whatsoever. Pivot irrigation, the pivot would swing round, um, it would take a day. And if the pivot switched off, um, the potatoes would just die with the heat intensity. The water had been pumped up from underneath the ground, maybe 200 metres down. It'll probably run out before the oil. And in the centre, you can put on the blight sprays and all anything else that's required to go onto the crop. Um, it, it was a, an incredible experience just to watch it. And there was a great problem with uh, evaporation and salts coming to the surface. So they had to go up and down doing a harrowing job. John, you've got but, 10 minutes this, left. Sorry? You've got 10 minutes, John. 10 minutes, okay. Okay. And here we see him um, looking at his crop. I bet he got some good crops. And, Hung and R Hungary, huge fields left after com communism. They put the farms together and big crops. And they wanted to grow chips as well. But uh, yeah, potatoes were the order of the day, main thing on the diet. And I was always encouraged to take a toast and say cheers. Hungarian for cheers was not simple. It is said earlier. Uh, apologies if there's anyone that can pronounce it better. And Romania, this was a walking holiday, long carts. And it, it just in a time warp, 50 year time warp, old steam engines. And we were on a walking holiday, my wife and I, with a group. And we hitchhiked a ride in a chain gang's woodcutter train and went up into the forest and then walked up onto the tops. And this was delightful, like the sound of music. Hey Meadows and uh, terrific. But small patches of potatoes lured me in. And this, this one's in particular, I noticed these grubs, ferocious appetites, you see them munching away at the leaves. These are actually Colorado beetles. And we don't have any in this country, but we've kept them out and the government's got a strict policy on this. This woman, she was having to squeeze the grubs with her fingers, because if it attacked a crop, there would be no potatoes on the plate. And these were the major item on the plate. Not like our Martin Wishart plates. Where is the potato? And Vietnam. Um, lovely scenes. Why grow potatoes? The families were growing and they would grow up. And agriculture, although it looked fun, like football, um, needed upgrading and they were growing potatoes in the mountains and good skinned potatoes like our supermarkets. The French had introduced them, you see them in the market. And this man, head of research and development, um, suggested that I might go for a meal or a dung restaurant. Well, I was a bit confused, but he pointed out that dung meant the right crowd. So the right crowd, the right food and the right beer. And there we were in a goat restaurant and we were talking about genetic modification. He said, it's a pity your company doesn't do it because our population, 60 million going on 100 million and we need food solutions now. And as I choked on the gristle, he suggested I have a drink and it was either to be embryo snake or fungus. I took fungus, I'm still here. <laughs> and Another trip to the east, I met Jack Dong at the World Potato Congress and we went out there. My, my wife was going to her white bridesmaid's birthday uh, and Chinaman Square, the Warriors. Sure. But how were we going to get to Jack Dong's potato field? We'd been invited there. So we left the city and the cities, I just couldn't believe couldn't get quite used to it, a billion and a half people, and they needed food solutions. McDonald's is there, more McDonald's than the rest of the world put together. And we travelled up 
you can see the traffic on the roads and over the mountains to the plains, the steppes, where they were growing potatoes. And you could see this, these potatoes mounted on, we are right in the middle of the harvest. And yes, um, Kubla Khan was there in Xanadu. I didn't quite believe this. Taylor Coleridge, Olivia Newton-John, I thought it was made up place. But it was where Kubel Khan had his summer palace, twice five miles of fertile ground. Genghis Khan's horses, perhaps, and potatoes, stretching out for miles and miles and miles. And Jack Dong had hand pickers there. It was just an extraordinary sight. Potato noodles at the banquet that night. And these were made of potatoes. As you can see, we got some when we came home. And doesn't look so good, but in a Korean hot pot, these were absolutely delicious. So we had a feasted, and there are lots of different varieties. I can't go have time to go into all of these, but over 5,000 different varieties. And this man took us on a journey at the Chelsea Flower Show. Quite incredible. Morris and Anne Innes, my wife and I are helping out. A lot of competition there, but his potatoes were stunning. And the crowds just adored them. Everybody had a potato story. It's a, amazing how appealing the potato is. And then Monty Don came on the scene. And I could see him here having words with Morris. They made good TV. And so we landed in the wild potatoes of Peru. I'm sorry, we're wonderful scene potato markets, colourful, different. And we went up over to Machu Picchu and camped overnight uh, with lots of 14 others and 14 porters. And then on to the Park de la Papa. These are the guardians of the wild potatoes. Just Rona, my wife and myself went there. And a great, uh, a great journey there, different varieties this potato that made the, the bride wheat, and a ploughing demonstration, and then planting. Llama dung. And just watching the families doing it, and then I had a go. Exhausting at 4,000 metres, it's very difficult. And paying homage to the mountain, to the earth, and to the sun with coca leaves. It was just a wonderful experience, and the foods or terrific guinea pig casserole and breakfast time and then exchange of views and that was it time to go home um it was sad but i take all these stories to everybody and into the classroom and hopefully those will come back in the future we might have some potato workshops and some of you might want to know how to grow potatoes why do you grow them for a whole host of reasons but really, you're, you're getting your sharing, sharing, fulfillment, food, and fun. It's a, a huge amount. And how do you grow them? Well, is it in the ground or in a container? You want to make a plan, get the action, buy the seed, plant, tend, and dig, and enjoy. Quite a simple exercise. And if any of you want a, a, a workshop, I can do it. It's important to buy classified seed. You'll note for the labels, because if you use uh, the supermarket potatoes, they might have some serious imported diseases, which could not only affect your garden, but the rest. And there are lots of varieties, earlies, second earlies, and main crop. They all take different time to grow. And just a glimpse of some of them, the earlies, Duke of York and Aaron Pilot, Kestrel, a wonderful uh, second early, and Charlotte, a salad and Desiree. Main crops were difficult, but I think the quirky ones for the garden are great. Pink ones or pink for apple. And chitting them, getting the team together. Telling them once and then they tell each other. It's a, it's a great experience in earthing them up. And hopefully the son, father of the grandchildren, will fur them up. Presto, it's done. 
and harvesting. Such a joy. Everybody of any age loves to harvest and then eat. What a joy. Salt cod and potatoes. A dog's dinner, perhaps. Yes. Or haggis. A final tip. Very final. Accordion potatoes. The trick is the big spoon. Watch the big spoon. It doesn't cut all the way through. Make the slices. Put on the, the salt, the pepper, the olive oil, whatever your diet allows. Put them in the oven for a full hour. Put on the cheese. And leave for another 15 minutes. Parmesan's quite good. But accordion potatoes, and you can see why. They just work like an accordion. So on that note, I will really have to end. I'm sorry I've gone a wee bit hard last year. Um, but yes, that's all, folks. Thank you, John. If you'd like to unshare, <laughs> stop the share. That's lovely. How absolutely fascinating and absolutely tantalising insight into potatoes. I think I think you might inspire another potato boom with that. <laughs> That's <laughs> terrific. <laughs> Fabulous. Now I'm going to invite um, Joe Cook, who is going to voice for us the questions to John. If I can just find Joe. Joe, are you there? <laughs> Hi. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Um, okay, John, we've got some good questions. That was really, really interesting. I've got lots of fond memories of harvesting potatoes with my grandfather. It's a lovely memory. So first one from Jenny was, what can we do in our gardens to prevent potato disease? Well, first of all, I think the most important thing is to plan it and have a rotation um, to prevent unseen diseases like eelworm, they attack the roots. So a four to five year rotation is best. Go to the garden centre or online, buy classified seed, and that will minimise most of the diseases. There are some others that creep in, um, but you just have to, to kind of manage them. Potato blight is, is seasonal, and you can do leaf trimming or chop them down. That's quite drastic. Um, so it's best to you know, follow a best practice. Excellent. Hopefully that helps some of us. Um, Joan asked, um, you mentioned lazy beds earlier in your talk. Um, how do you cultivate one and what are the benefits? It's a misnomer, lazy beds, I'm told, and I, I did try and make one. Um, it's really, I think, a benefit because it's hard work, because you're having to turn over the turf. The, uh, on the internet, you can see some diagrams, but you're, you're a trench and the, the width can vary from a metre to a metre and a half. Um, there's nothing specific in that. But you a trench down each side, and you're putting the, the turf on top. This is how they would have done it in Ireland and West Scotland. And then incorporating seaweed, or as they did, the contents of their house, which was, um, they kept cattle in the house, so that's maybe explanatory. Um, bracken. Um, and then dibble the potatoes in. The, the idea is to then was to raise them up because it's very, very wet. So you wouldn't actually need to do it here uh, on the east side. Uh, it is good fun. I've done it and it is hard. It is hard work. Um, it's easier just to put a drill and put your potatoes in. Excellent. I'll maybe stay clear of the lazy bed. That sounds like far too much hard work. Um, Katie asked, uh, what are your thoughts about the new techniques, machines and chemicals in terms of soil biodiversity? Well, yes, um, I, I was just um, attended a, a conference at the James Hunt Research Institute and the, there is great emphasis now on growers. And it's not just growers, it's about scientists like agronomists and everybody is working together to try and find solutions which are less chemicals. The potato blight, which is 10 sprays, uh, if they, 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 they've got people studying gene, the genomes, the genomic sequences, and by a bit of gene editing snipping, they could perhaps mean that less chemicals would be used uh, and that would be good. Um, 
there's a, a chemical used to take the tops off the potatoes. Again, resistance here, which is quite right. And the solution might be to pull the stems out, but so they're trying to develop new machines to do that. Um, so that all along the line, there's, there's a new problem. You know, government guidelines, researchers, everybody's trying to pull together, but <clears throat> the grower or the industry has got to provide food uh, for all the population. Um, and on, on that score, you, you know, you think of China, uh, we grow 6 million tonnes of potatoes, China grows 100 million tonnes, and they've moved up from 50 million to 100 million because they've got a huge population. And it's important um, that they go hand in hand, something that uh, is good for us, the, the people that eat them, and also it can be done um, profitably. Yes, Kate, this is probably a similar question from Kate. Um, she's alarmed to find out that most crops in Scotland are sprayed with glyphosate two weeks before harvest, including potatoes. Do you know of any shifts in practice that might Yeah, the glyphosate, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Uh, the potatoes, uh, no, but what the, the, one of the problems with potatoes, the farmers growing in all sorts of farms round about, they're not his. So the farmer... <laughs> The landowner then maybe plants a, a crop of wheat and he gets potatoes growing in amongst the wheat, which can harbour different types of diseases, eelworm, which is very, very serious, and potato blight. So they, they've sprayed with glycophosphate, but uh, the potato, no, they don't spray that, but they, they are working um, on, on other ways of, of handling this problem. But um, as, as yet, it's... Um, no easy, no easy way out in this one. Um, Jane asked, which variety of potato is the easiest to grow for us complete beginners? And yeah, if you're a beginner, if, whether you're doing it in, in a pot or, you know, I, I would go for either an early potato or, or a salad potato. Something like Charlotte is, is quite dependable. It's a, it's a good favourite. It goes well in containers, you know, easy to grow. I, I grow... I like growing some of the awkward ones, the iron pilots and the uh, Duke of York's because they've got a better flavor and that's why I grow them. And I think you've got to think, why, why are you growing them? If it's a flavor, go for more of the awkward ones, but it's for ease, uh, something like Swift, it's an early potato, but stick with the early potatoes or the second earlies because the main crop need the, huge, the long growing season and by that time, blight or something else comes in because you can't use chemicals. Um, so I, I steer clear of uh, the main crop, which, you know, there's great varieties, King Edward and Bajiri. Well, that's good. Some great suggestions there. Um, Jenny asked, is potato production still regulated in the UK? No, um, it's not as such. There, there is something called a levy board. Um, so, yes, you could grow as many potatoes as you want, but the cost of production are, are so great. Most, most farmers have given up. 80,000 used to grow and now only 2,000 grow. It's a, it's a highly specialised uh, highly specialised job. But when the potato board was disbanded, they, they had a, a regulation. They didn't want anybody to grow if uh, more than an acre of potatoes. But... Um, those are days long past, and uh, yeah, you could grow as many potatoes as you like, but finding a market, because the, the markets are restricted to, you know, the, the, the fry makers like McCain's, or the crisp makers like Walker's, or the supermarkets, and they'll only deal with, uh, with certain people, uh, you know, with the ones they know where they're going to get a continuity of good supplies. Um, another question, uh, can you still buy the potato variety lumper? Say that again? Can you still buy the potato variety ah, lumper? Is it lumper? lumper? Yeah, I, I got mine um, from, I'm not sure. <laughs> I know that there, there is a specialist grower up in Angus Potato House and they they're doing all sorts of varieties and I was trying to encourage him to grow it. It's, it's just a, a wonderful looking variety and great talking point. Um, 
but it's, it's difficult to revive these old potatoes and it's only somebody like him that can do it. I, I got my, my source was from government plots. They won't be lost. And if sufficient numbers want it, uh, this commercial grower can be encouraged to do it. But it's got to come through the pipeline. It can't just appear. And, you know, uh, just on that score, old potatoes, I, we went out to Peru and at, at Chelsea Flower Show, I, I would often hear people saying, oh, I just put some in my pocket. The, the thing you don't want to do is bring back potatoes because it could potentially bring back drastic diseases from all sorts of countries and coming them in here. So you have to go through the seed channel and uh, try Potato House and email them and say, why well, haven't got... <laughs> Lumpers. That's the best chance. Yeah, uh, Patricia's mentioned uh, Potato House as well, actually, that they have lots of great information um, and seed tatties, many of which are organic. So that's useful to know. Um, I'm not sure. Let me just check. I don't have any more questions for you. Uh, yeah, Joan says she can thoroughly recommend Aaron Pilot as a bag grown potato for beginners. Absolutely. And Aaron Pilot for 30, 40 years was the third most popular variety. It was Majestic, then King Edward, then an Iron Pilot. But in today's world, um, you won't get any in the supermarket. It's, it's too awkward to grow, but I love it. I'll always grow it because it's got a, a lovely waxy um, firm and that real, to me, it's a new potato taste. Maybe it's nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> lovely. Jenny, I have no more questions in the chat. Thanks, John. Okay. Thank you very much, John. And thank you, Joe, for voicing all these questions. That was absolutely terrific, John. And um, I'm sure there might be more questions that people may want to ask after the event. Can we put them to you? Can we forward these questions to you afterwards? Yes. Yes, by all means. And if, if any groups want to organise a, a small Zoom time workshop or when things get easier, if they want me in person, I can, I could come down and do it. I know I've had experience with the schools and various groups there. Well, that's excellent. Thank you very much for that offer. We'll, um, we, we'll send out an email after the um, session and uh, include that information in it and uh, how to get in contact with you. So. Thank you very much, John. If you would all like to show your appreciation to John, we can, um, if you can hover over your reactions button at the bottom, we can give him a round of applause. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Thanks very much, John. And uh, we're going to give him a little bit of a clap there. That was lovely. Thank you, right. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, many of you have made a donation to Trellis, but if you've enjoyed today's session, please consider making a donation to us that helps support this type of work. Um, you may be interested in our plastic free gardening book offer, which is on this week too, and there will be a link in the chat there just now, um, and uh, you can go to our online shop to do that. So I would like to bring this session to a close. We look forward to seeing you perhaps at one of our later sessions this week there's lots to choose from on our website so we'd be delighted to see you later so i'd just like to say goodbye from all of us and see you again thank you bye bye goodbye bye <laughs>